I am a broken human being. Were it not for the good grace of a gracious God, I would be on a never-ending downward spiral to spiritual oblivion. I don't tell you this to tell you how humble I am. I'm telling it to you because it's the truth. And were it not for His grace and His promise that He has not finished with me yet, He who has begun a good work in me will also complete it. He is trying, and He will complete His work. We praise His name. And just in case you hadn't noticed, you're just like me. When it comes to this gospel of Jesus Christ, we are no different than one beggar calling other beggars to bread. God has called you and me to serve our world, to lead men and women into the glorious knowledge that He has given to us, and to experience the delights of walking with Jesus, who is, by the way, the only true north in the Seventh-day Adventist church. He must be always held in a preeminent position in everything that we do. Would you pray with me, please? Oh God, our Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you so much that you have promised us that as we gather together, you'll be here. Uh, We claim that promise today, Lord. Be here with us. We have prayed already for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit, and we come to you right now yielding to you, asking that you would use each one of us as we speak, as we listen, as we plan on how we will reach our world for Jesus. Be with us. In his precious name, amen. Well, I have to make a confession uh, to you this morning another confession, and that is that uh, most men would make a similar uh, confession. Uh, When I was young, I lived with my mother, two sisters, and a father, but on Friday night in the 50s and the 60s, Adventist women looked weird. Now, you ladies, you you can get angry at me, but anybody who walks around the house like this looks a little weird. I think you have to admit that. It looks beautiful on Sabbath morning, but on Friday night, they look like Martians. Or they looked like Martians. Today, we have all, the women have all kinds of other devices, although I'm sure some women still do that, and their husbands smile politely. Well, you know, when I was a younger person, much younger person, about 13 years of age, I decided one Friday night to escape the madness at home and go to a dance. And I did. I went to a dance. I was dancing or trying to dance with a girl. Now, the dance hall, let me tell you first, the dance hall was up a flight of stairs. And, you know, so you had to walk up to get there. So I'm dancing with this girl, and I am standing directly in front of, or I'm looking right out the rear door of the dance hall. And then I saw them. And what was attached to them was my mother's head. (laughs) And she came into the dance hall. Now, I need to let you know that my mother was a very, very 
very conservative Seventh-day Adventist. To go into a dance hall on Friday night was anathema. It was way out of her comfort zone. But sure enough, up they came, and she came into the dance hall, and she looked at me, and she did the most effective thing a mother could ever do on that occasion. She stood there and cried. Oh, I want to tell you, so effective was the punishment that I've never been back to another dance on Friday night or Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. <laughs> this woman went way out of her comfort zone to call her son home, to tell me that I was in the wrong place. But she didn't have to use words. She used love. Now, I asked the question to begin with today because we want to look at this carefully. I asked the question, just how far will God go to reach you, your loved ones, the people in your community? How far will God go? And in order to answer this question, I want a self-description. I don't want to hear what others say. I want to hear what God says about it. So I turn your attention to Luke chapter 15. If you have a Bible, turn there with me, if you will. But it begins this way. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, and I love this word, muttered. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety and nine and in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found the lost sheep. I tell you, Jesus said, that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And we might insert there, who do not think they need to repent. And Jesus goes on, or suppose a woman had ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light the lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And then Jesus moves on to tell that precious story that we are all so familiar with, the story of the, the son who left home, the prodigal. Give me what, I, what is mine and let me go. And the father did. I just want to tell you that the father in this story is much more generous than me. I didn't have anything to give, but the reality is that he went away. And while he was still a long way off, the Bible says, at the end of this sojourn, the father saw him as he was coming home and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him and said, bring the fatted gluten. <clears throat> It was two months before the crucifixion of Jesus, and Jesus was in a place called Perea, and everywhere he went, as he moved from place to place, the Bible tells us that publicans and sinners followed him, and as they came, they were inevitably followed by those who had come to spy. They had been hired by the Pharisees to trap Jesus in his words and to criticize his acts of compassion. They branded and labeled everyone. It was the only way they could maintain their self-conceived superiority. <clears throat> and as Jesus is mingling with the crowd, 
They had the audacity to say, this man, they muttered, this man eats with sinners and welcomes them. You see, the accusations made against him were true. They described the very nature of his work. Jesus had come to welcome sinners and to eat with them. I was preaching a, a sermon similar to this, and in, in my home church, I, I was preaching, and a man jumped up in the balcony, and he yelled out, the church is filled with hypocrites. And I looked at him, and I said, I know. That's why I belong. And I went on preaching, and he jumped up, and he made the second statement. He said, you're trying to save everyone. I looked at him and said, so is God. So is God. Ellen White, Christ Object Lessons, page 186 says, the people, the souls who came to Jesus felt that in his presence, even for them, there was an escape from the pit of sin. Uh, the Pharisees had only scorn and condemnation for them, but Christ greeted them as children of God, estranged indeed from the Father's house, but not forgotten by the Father's heart. Everyone felt value in the presence of Jesus. And if you and I sing the song, let me be like Jesus, then people ought to feel comfortable in our presence. Jesus did not pick and choose those to whom he would extend his grace. Every person was valued. Every person, regardless of his or her situation, found grace in Jesus. Now, sometimes we think that we can whip people into shape, put a little pressure on them, call them to our standard. And yet I want to challenge you, if you feel that way, to read Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, where the Apostle Paul comes to this conclusion. God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. It is not judging and condemning that do the work of conversion. People do not change because they are damned by us, either individually or collectively. It is God's kindness that leads people to repentance. That is not to say, however, that as a church, that there are not times when we must employ godly discretion to correct situations. Uh, the message today, the message from Jesus today, is not that we throw away standards and values. It is rather that we understand Him. So Jesus tells these three parables in Luke 15, the parable of the lost sheep, parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son. These parables demonstrate three specific kinds of human brokenness, of human lostness, if you will. The lost sheep represents those who are lost and don't know it. Uh, the lost coin represents those who are alienated from God right at home. And the lost son represents those who have dismissed God, who have walked away from him. My second observation is that in each of these stories, God is portrayed differently. And you know that. In the parable of the lost sheep, God portrays himself as the good shepherd. In the parable of the lost coin, God portrays himself as a woman, a woman who sweeps. In the parable of the lost son, God portrays himself as the father who waits and then embraces. However, there is a commonality to these stories because in all three of these stories, the joy and the generosity of the great seeker, the great searcher, is unbounded when he comes to help the, the, the hurting and the wounded of life. You see, friends, we often attempt to put God into an intellectual box that we have devised. 
Sometimes we do that based on the experiences that we've had in our own life. But I want to tell you, when we move into the territory of Luke chapter 15, we are talking about the self-description of the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, immutable, and and infinitely unchangeable God. He describes himself here. This is not some kind of Jackson substandard revised version. This is God telling us who he really is. You see, the parables demonstrate the character of God lived out within the context of human brokenness. The character of God moving into the lives of broken people like you and me. How far will God go? What is God's design, not only for you, but your loved ones, those who you ache over, and those on your street? Romans chapter 5, verse 8, we repeat again, but God commends His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And Lamentations 3.21, yet this I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, for His compassions fail not. They are new every Sunday. Y'all aren't quite awake. (laughs) Every morning, great is your faithfulness. And then if God is for us, Romans chapter 8, verse 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, give us, graciously give us all things? You see, what God has promised to you and me is the gift of his son in our daily life, and then all other spiritual things that we require. We serve a gracious and generous God. I love this statement, all the paternal love which has come down from generation to generation through the channel of human hearts, all the springs of tenderness which have opened in the souls of men are but as a tiny rill compared to the boundless ocean when compared with the infinite and exhaustless love of God. So Jesus tells three stories. He tells the story of the lost sheep, the person who is lost and doesn't know it, and the great seeker, the shepherd, goes out in search. I was at a potluck one Sabbath afternoon, and uh, <clears throat> as I was sitting next to a, a, a gentleman, and I, I used to call him a kindly old gentleman, but I'm almost as old as he was then now, so I, I can't call him that anymore, but I will call him that. He was a very kindly, elderly gentleman, and uh, I was sitting next to him. And as I was sitting there, we had exchanged pleasantries, but soon the pastor walked by, and he said to this gentleman, Robert, why don't you tell your story, give your testimony to Pastor Dan? And he looked at me and said, would you like to hear my story? And I said, I'd love to hear your story. And he proceeded. Now, I want you to know that as he proceeded, There was no chest beating. There was no braggadocio. This was the testimony of a transformed person. He said, when I was 16 years of age, I went into a drugstore with a gun, and I held up the drugstore. They caught me a half an hour later. I wasn't a very good robber. They caught me a half an hour later, uh, put me in jail, took me to court, sentenced me to two years in adult jail. They actually pushed me up to adult court because of the 
severity of the crime. I didn't hurt anybody, but I went to prison. And in prison, in two years, I made a vow, a solemn vow. He said, my vow was that when I got out, I would find the judge that sentenced me and I would kill him. And he looked at me with sad eyes and he said, and when I got out, I did. I murdered the judge in cold blood. Took his wife and his daughter, kidnapped them, went across the line into the United States, got as far as the Oregon-California border. I was apprehended and brought back to Canada and went in front of another judge who sentenced me to life in prison without parole. Why would God waste his time on that? He went on in his story to say, I went to jail, and when I went to jail or went to prison, he said, I, the only way I knew then was, was to defend myself, to be violent. And one day in the course of a fight, I put a knife in another man and killed him too. Now I'm beginning to wonder, why am I sitting here? I will agree with everything he says. He said, I was the most desperate, alone, horrible person. Then entered, now I don't like to call him this, but it seems like a crazy Seventh-day Adventist. He had studied the story, he would read the story of Robert. And he decided that he would go and try to appeal to Robert. You know, friends, we get ideas. Sometimes there are ideas, but there are ideas that God puts in your head and mine. They are for divine appointments. We can so easily slough them off. But when we are impressed, we need to follow through with the impression excuse me, asking God, asking God to help us. And so this Seventh-day Adventist got the clearance to actually go into a maximum security penitentiary and talk to Robert. (coughs) Excuse me. He got the permission. He went in and he He said, the first time I I, I came in, they ushered me to his cell, and, you know, he said, I hadn't had any training, I hadn't had any background, I was just moved, I was moved to go see Robert, so he said, I stood outside his cell, and I said to him, Robert, God loves you, and so do I. There was the speech. It did not take a seminary degree to give him the ability to say that, but he was led by God. Robert, God loves you, and so do I. And Robert told me in those days, I had a very big retinue of curse words, and I shared every one of them with him. The man went away, but he kept coming Christ will never abandon the soul for whom he has died. You know, some of you sit here today, you're aching because of your children. A child, a daughter, a son, a brother, a father, a mother, whoever. You ache because of it. God doesn't give up. God doesn't give up. Neither did this Seventh-day Adventist layperson. He kept going back and back and back and back. And, And... Every time he would go back, he would say the same to Robert. And this went on for quite some time until ultimately, eventually, there was a breakthrough. You see, Robert was living in quiet desperation. He had murdered two men. He was hated in the prison, and he hated the prison. And so he had made a decision that he would commit suicide by toothbrush. How do you do that? 
he took his toothbrush and rubbed it against the cinder block in his cell to make a very finely honed sharp knife. His plan was, as he was in solitary confinement, to wait till when the guard came and fed him in the morning, he would grab the guard by the throat and slit his throat. Then the people on the gangplank who were loaded with weapons would blow him away. That was his plan. That's how desperate some people get. Why should God waste his time on someone who has murdered two of his creatures? Why would God do that? The night before he was going to put his plan into action, Robert went to bed. But before he got into bed, he looked at the little box that he had been allowed to take with him. And he told me this story. He said, Pastor, I looked through this box, and in it I found a Bible that my mother had given to me. He said, you do not have to believe what I'm about to tell you, but I tell you it is the truth. He said, I picked that Bible out of the box, and I pulled it to tear it apart, and my eyes fell right on the words, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He said it hit me with a force I have never been hit with before. I took my pillow. I wrapped it around my head. I got under my bed and I cried all night. But when I got out of the bed in the morning, I had given my life to Jesus. Well, our Seventh-day Adventist layperson kept visiting with him, gave him Bible studies, and you know, they eventually baptized Robert. But when they did it, they did it like this, the shackles on his arms and shackles on his feet. And that's how they baptized him, because they were afraid Well, Robert began to change, and he began to change in big ways, and eventually his change was so radical that he actually became an assistant chaplain in the prison. And without request, the Paroles Board of Canada eventually released him from prison. Listen to this statement again from Christ Object Lessons. The people who you hate and look down on are the property of God. By creation and redemption, they are his, and they are of value to him. As the shepherd loves his sheep and cannot rest if one is missing, so in an infinitely higher degree does God love every outcast soul. Men may deny the claim of his love. They may wander from him. They may choose another master. Yet they are God's and he longs to recover his own. Why would God do it? Because he longs to recover his own. He loves in a way that we do not understand. Waste his time on the Roberts of the world. Parable number two, the lost coin. God portrays himself as a woman, as a woman who sweeps. Uh, For all who have a little problem with the activity of women, this really says that God can move and does move through all people, through all people. The lost coin Here is a woman, here is a woman who sweeps until she finds a valued object, a coin. Now, if this was a woman today who had to sweep to find a coin in the floor, there's a whole other series of problems that we would have to talk about. But we're talking about a home in the ancient Near East, a home that was often a dirt floor. So it would be easy for a coin to be lost in the dust. 
as people shuffled around in the house. She lost a coin. She did not give up until she found the coin. The coin is a symbol of those people who are lost right at home. Again, it may be a son, a daughter, a husband, a wife, a mother-in-law, father-in-law, who knows? Every one of us has a story. Every one of us has a heartache over someone in the family who right at home may be lost. As a matter of fact, it may be right in the church that people attend but are lost, alienated from God. Well, you know, Canadians do love hockey. You understand that, right? We actually think it's a rip-off when the Stanley Cup is played in the United States and there's no teams from Canada playing. You don't have to be angry about me for that because most of you don't care. <laughs> but uh, when I was three years of age, I started skating. And I didn't start in indoor skating rinks. It was outdoor and we played in all kinds of weather. But, you know, one night my mother was visiting us, and it was always a, a good thing to have mom come and visit. She was a wonderful Christian woman, and how I long to see her when Jesus comes. But she came, and she was in our house, and she said to my son and I, if you two would like to go to a hockey game, I'll pay well, that sounded a good, like a good deal. There was no hockey game in our town, but there was a community close by where there was a hockey game. And so we said, great. And we jumped in the car and we went. And my son and I went to watch hockey. My mother brought her knitting. <clears throat> it was a wonderful game. Now, here's the second part of this story. At that time, I had been called to a congregation that had this fellowship, 12 people, not, well, I guess it was quite a while ago before I got there. They had this fellowship, 12 people, because they were trying to get ready for Jesus to come. Th th their words, not mine. They were trying to purge the church from the unwanted elements. So they threw people out of the church. And uh, they threw them out for, well, they threw them out for going to hockey games, which was an anti-Canadian function. I'm not sure. It shouldn't have gone before law as treason, but they threw people out for that cause. They threw people out. They threw a person out because she wore slacks in her orchard. Because the Bible says, a woman must not wear that which pertaineth to a man. You ever see a woman in a dress up a 10-foot ladder picking apples? There'd be a whole other process that would need to take place, right? Right? And the first board meeting I sat with these people, they said to me, Pastor, we have sinned. We are convinced that we sinned by doing what we did. It was hypocritical. It was wrong. We didn't work with those people. We just threw them out. Now that happened in probably in the 50s. So don't I don't see that happening anywhere today. But they said, we have sinned. I said to that group, now, you know, generally when we sin, we need to go to God in prayer and ask for forgiveness. So why don't we do that? You know, friends, it is true that congregations can sin. They can blow it, make mistakes. And conferences can blow it and make mistakes. And unions can blow it and make mistakes. And divisions can blow it and make mistakes. And I'm not going any farther than that. 
We have sinned. So I said, let's pray and ask God for forgiveness. And we got on our knees and we asked God to forgive the congregation for the hypocritical actions that had been taken. Sometimes there is need for church discipline. I am not denying that at all. Don't misunderstand me. But this was straight out pharisaical hypocrisy, and they knew it. We asked God, forgive us. When we got up off of our knees, I made a pledge to them. I said, I will try to find those 12 people and invite them to come home. I want to tell you, friends, it's far easier to drive people out of the church than it is to bring them back. But in this story of Jesus, the woman searches. She sweeps in the dirt. So I looked and looked, but I could not. I found one, and I talked to him, but he was very unconvinced that he would ever come back to the church. So we're sitting in my living room, and my mother makes this wonderful uh, invitation, this wonderful proposal. Let's go to a hockey game. We jump in the car. We go to the hockey game. We, she takes her knitting, and it's a good game. Except about halfway through the second period, the referee makes an absolutely atrocious call. And I jump to my feet, and I yelled at the top of my lungs, you bonehead! This is not Christian. As I sat down, the man next to me said to me, you know, you are right in that call. You are right in what you said. That was the dumbest thing I've ever seen. And then he looked into my eyes and said, you're not from our town, are you? And I said, no, no, we live down the hill. And he said, well, what do you do? <laughs> I told him I was a technician for General Motors. <laughs> I said to him, I'm a pastor. <laughs> and what I just did, I cannot defend. It was not right. It was not Christian. And I'm sorry you had to hear it, the people around. He then looked at me and said, what church? <laughs> First Baptist. <laughs> I had to tell him I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. <laughs> and he all of a sudden changed his countenance and he pulled away from me and he said, well, if you're a Seventh-day Adventist preacher, what are you doing at this hockey game? I was kicked out of your church for going to hockey games. You know, I pulled close to him and I said, you know, I, what I did was wrong, but I want you to know, friend, this is a divine appointment. I have been looking for you. And I've come to ask your forgiveness on behalf of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. What was done to you was wrong. And I have a request. Will you come home? We want you to come home. And he did. It was wonderful. He became a deacon. He was a part of the church family again. I was in that church two times, by the way. I pastored uh, for three and a half years one time, and, and then about ten years later, I went back for another three and a half. I, I used to tell people that was the period of papal persecution, and I did it twice to that congregation. <laughs> the first time around, he found his life in Jesus. When I went back the second time, I buried him. But when he died, he died in Jesus. How far will God go to reach out to that son, that daughter, 
that loved one of yours, right in your home, who is alienated from God, hurting, wounded. God wants to use you and me to reach those people. God wants to use you and me to reach the hurting and the wounded and the alienated in our communities, in our cities, our workplaces, our schools. God wants to use us. How far would God go? The final story is always a, a story that breaks our hearts. When we read it, you know, I often tear up when I read it, but I tear up for a reason other than the fact that Jesus told the story, because this story has a huge significance to our family, to my wife and I, and I tell it to you today because I have permission to do that from a very special, wonderful child. She was, is, our middle daughter. And at 16 years of age, she looked at me in the face and she said, you have no more authority in my life. You have no effect on me at all. And she left. We actually took her to the bus in Canada. I don't know what the laws in the state of Tennessee are or in Georgia, but uh, in Canada, as long as you know where your child is, the police will not apprehend them, nor will they attempt to prevent them from leaving your home. We took her to the bus and away she went. The day we did that, that my eldest daughter was on one side, my wife on the other, and I thought my heart was going to come right out of my mouth. You want to talk about being broken? I'm sure some, if not many of you, have had that kind of experience in one way or the other. But this was my daughter, and she was leaving home. It was painful. One time during a period of six months, I did see her, took her out for lunch, and we had a very pleasant time, but she had no intention of coming home. Six months after, six months after she left, she phoned, and she said, and by the way, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I, and I don't want to be too late, um, we still have 10 minutes. Uh, she came to me and we talked and I actually wrote a letter to her. And this is what I said in the letter. I will never ask God to protect you from the consequences of your own sin. You are leaving our home in rebellion. I will never ask God to protect you from the consequences of your sin, but I will ask him to save you. I will ask him to save you. Six months later, she phoned home. She said, Daddy, you were right. I have made a fool of myself. I'm pregnant. Now, people ask me, why do you tell this story? Well, number one, I asked permission from her, and this was her statement. Daddy, if you can use my story to help even one person... Use it everywhere. And while we're at it, God didn't have to tell us that a third of the angels bucked his authority. Daddy, I have made a fool of myself. I am pregnant. And the baby may not survive. And I remember saying to her, my wife and I always through this whole thing together had prayed together and talked together and worked together and I said to her I have only six words for you come on home I love you period and she came home and friends you know we did not have to say to her do you know what you did all she had to do was look down 
We did, not, we did not lecture her. We did not talk to her about this situation. Only once did we come close to a conversation. We just backed away because she knew that her teenage years were over. We told her, you, we want you to stay in our home, in your home, but we will not raise your child. You will raise the child. And you will be responsible for it. But we will love it. You know, they, what do you do when you're a pastor? We had a member of a church, about 650 members. And I told my conference president, and he said, well, first of all, you probably need to send your daughter away, which I said will not happen. And, uh, you know, the idea you could lose your ministry. And I went and sat. I called a church board meeting. And my wife sat right next to me. And, you know, I I, I do want to give a testimony to God's goodness because he gave me the most wonderful wife. And I can't see her right now, but wherever you are, sweetheart. Oh, yeah, okay, I see you. God gave me the most wonderful wife who has stood with me through all kinds of things. And uh, I love her more today than I did the day we were married. We called the church board, and I told them, well, my daughter is coming home, and she is coming home pregnant. Um, I want to assure you that I am a believer that no one person is more important than the congregation including the pastor, and you have every right to say to me today, take a hike, Mike. Just give me some time so that I can find another place, another job, or whatever, because I like to eat. They actually sent us out of the room. They said, we want to talk about this. I offered, I will leave. If you want me to leave, if my ministry has ended here, I will leave. They met together. At, 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 I say it was about an hour. My wife says more like 15 minutes. And You know who the evangelist is in the family. <clears throat> we came back, and uh, they said, Pastor, uh, we don't want your family to leave. That congregation ministered to our family. In the process of it, something started to happen in the life of a little girl. She gave herself to Jesus. Today, she calls me and asks me, so how's your faith, Dad? She is the principal of a 12th grade Seventh-day Adventist school. She gave her life to Jesus. Why should God waste his time on people who humiliate us? On people who shake us to the foundation of who we are. Why would God do that? We're his people. Why is he helping those guys? You see, at the end of this story, you have a second son. A second son who realized there was a party going on because daddy was happy. Listen, friends, what we need to understand is that this chapter in the Word of God is not about some airy-fairy dreamed-up scheme about who God is. This is God incarnate, Jesus telling the world, this is who I am. I am come that they might understand who the Father is, and this is what we're like. Rejoicing, joy, happiness, when someone who has spit in the face of God and spit in your face and my face, joy when they return home. Then there was the brother, of course, who said, you never did that for me. I've been a number one grade A tithe-paying Seventh-day Adventist all these years. 
that guy goes and messes up and you throw a party for him? And hear the words of the father. I had to celebrate. I was compelled to celebrate for this son of mine, this son of mine was once dead, but is alive. This daughter of mine was once dead, but is now alive. How far will God go? I conclude with these words. The value of a soul, who can estimate? Would you know its worth? Go to Gethsemane and there watch with Christ through those hours of anguish when he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. Look upon the Savior uplifted on the cross. Hear that despairing cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Look upon the wounded head, the pierced side, the marred feet. Remember that Christ risked all for our redemption. Heaven itself was imperiled at the foot of the cross, remembering that for one sinner, Christ would have laid down his life for one sinner, for you, for that son, for that daughter, for that neighbor, for that friend. For one sinner, Christ would have laid down his life. That's how you may estimate the value of a soul. God loves you. Praise his holy name. Regardless of what others say, regardless of your own self-condemnation, regardless of what the aficionados want you to believe, this is an inalienable truth. God loves you, and he loves those around you. Amen. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are awed by the majesty, the magnificence of your love. And oh God, today we thank you for the privilege of being able to understand what it is that you are really about, what you are really like. Heavenly Father, there may be people here today and listening through the streaming devices who have been lost without knowing it, who are alienated right at home or right in the church, and those who have dismissed you as inconsequential and unneeded. Father, if there's one person like that, who has been touched by your spirit today and has received a glimpse of the glory of God and who wants to say to you, I believe, help my unbelief. Help me to reintegrate into the family of God. Help me to find my way to God for the first time. There's one person like that. I want to encourage you, if you're at home, just say yes. If you're here, just raise your hand. Our eyes are closed. And Heavenly Father, please bless each person. And we will give you the grace, and pr- or the praise rather, for your grace. And pray in Jesus' name, amen.